It is indeed an honor to be with each of you today. Um, as Johnny mentioned, I have um, had the privilege of working with your colleagues in the Greenville office. And then earlier this week, I was actually with your colleagues in Atlanta, and I did a session um, for them. But thoroughly enjoy being connected to this organization and really want to commend you on the work that you're doing already in the space of I and D. And let me go ahead and mention, I love the fact that you place emphasis on the I, because most people do talk about it as the D and I, but the fact that you put the I first means that you get it. And I think that's incredibly important and we'll talk a little bit more about that today. So to add to what Johnny has shared, I do want to give you a little bit additional context about my background because it's going to help shape a lot of the conversations we'll have today. It'll give you a framework of why I have the philosophical foundational knowledge and perspective that I do around this work of diversity and inclusion. And um, I just want you to have the benefit of knowing some of that information. So I did start my career in the field of marketing communications, and I was working in that industry for a number of years, and I remember sitting in my office one day and I had an epiphany. I was thinking about the fact that I love the career path that I was in of advertising, marketing, communications. I really appreciated the fast-paced, dynamic environment. It was always on time, on budget, on strategy. And equally important, I love the clients that I work for and being a part of that process of creating success for brands that were really looking to have an impact in the, in the marketplace. But as I sat and I pondered how much I really enjoyed that career path, I had this epiphany, and it was this. Why can I enjoy this career path to the level of which I am, but there aren't others who look like me that's also taking advantage of this career path? And when you consider that, I was in the industry of marketing communications where our charge as an advertising agency was to be a smart marketing partner for our clients, there was a business case. It begged the question, why are we not being more intentional in our approach to make sure that our environment is very inclusive and that we have all of those perspectives at the table? Because guess what? Our clients were servicing diverse America. And so we needed to make sure that we were being more thoughtful about how in which we were teaming and um, identifying ways in which we could add value to our clients. And so I remember going to the president CEO at the time, who was very hands-on with the agency. He still led the Monday morning staff meetings of a 400 plus person organization. And at the time we had a BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal, and that BHAG was to become the most admired agency in the Southeast. We also had an agency in New York, and I was in between both of those offices, and what I noticed is that when I would go to New York, the environment was so much different. Of course, you were in the city, so you had a lot more diversity that was um, a part of those organizations, but I still desire that same level of diversity within the the agency here in South Carolina. So I went to the president CEO, we had a very thoughtful discussion, and I shared with him, I see an opportunity for us. And this is going to make us smarter marketing partners to our clients. I knew at the time that folks were knocking on the doors of agencies in Chicago and New York, again, the advertising capitals of the world. And what they were saying is, you need to diversify. This is not a suggestion, it is a mandate. We'll be back in about six months to see how you're doing. Well, if our BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal, was to be the most admired agency in the Southeast, why are we waiting for someone to knock on our door to tell us that we need to do something in order to help satisfy that? Why not demonstrate leadership in this capacity and make sure that we are, again, smart marketing partners to our clients? So he listened very intently. He nodded his head. He said, Nika, I agree. We're going to do it, and you're going to lead it. I was prepared for everything in that conversation with the exception of that last question, which was, now how do we do it? But what I knew how to do was to put really smart people in my camp, in my circle, that were very accomplished in this space, and we went to work. I always like to share that story because I know of many organizations that are starting out in this space of IND, DNI. Sometimes they feel like this is a huge mountain to climb, and they feel like there's so much that we have to tackle that sometimes it can become quite overwhelming. But the message that I have is we all have to start at some place. And the benefit to each of you is that you've already started this work. You already have leaders that are already trying to coalesce around this journey of creating success in the space of diversity and inclusion for the organization and beyond. And I think that you have a great start. What I hope to do today is to help you further that journey and to help provide some foundational knowledge and common language upon which each of you can talk about and engage around this work so that you can continue on this journey in a very successful manner. Fast forwarding in my career, 
Um, not only did I continue to serve as marketing and communications professional, but then I started to really own the work of diversity and inclusion. And through that, it led me down a pathway of several other opportunities where I started serving as VP of diversity and inclusion with the Greenville Chamber, and that was about five or six years ago. Earlier this year, I branched out and had the entrepreneurship bug, and I launched Nico White Consulting, where I do management consulting around the work of diversity and inclusion. And very specifically, I intersect the work of inclusion, um, diversity, business, and leadership. And that's really my sweet spot. So with that in mind, I have been fortunate to speak as an authority um, on this topic to several different organizations all across the country, private, public sector, and um, have had a lot of work that I, that's been featured and published in different publications. And I'm so honored today to be able to add your organization to the list of the roster of clients that I service. So I want to jump right in. There are two main objectives today that we're going to tackle in our time. And I will share with you that I want this to be really interactive. There's going to be multiple opportunities for each of you to engage, for each of you to really try to apply some of the skills training that we're going to implement today. And I look forward to being able to hear from you and learn from you because I think that we all have something to add to contribute to this conversation. So the first objective is I want to encourage a more leadership approach to the way in which each of you understand and practice diversity and inclusion. And then secondly, I want to accelerate your growth as an intentional inclusionist. And we're gonna talk about what that means, how does that show up in the marketplace, why that's important, and I will even give you an opportunity to do an assessment where you can reflect on your leadership style as an inclusion-minded leader to see how you're showing up in that capacity. Are you with me so far? Okay, so we're gonna jump right in. I believe in skills training. I don't wanna come here and just transfer knowledge to you. I want you to walk out of here with the ability to be equipped and empowered to take some of this knowledge to then be able to apply it to your respective roles within the organization. So skills training is important. So with that in mind, I wanna talk specifically about what we want to do with our skills training opportunity that's presented to us today. The first is, there is a lot of misinformation that's out there about the work of diversity and inclusion. And oftentimes, because there's a lot of misinformation, there tends to be resistance. And so what I want to do is to create a clean slate to where we all have common knowledge and a foundational understanding of what this is, so that again, there's a lack of, um, of misunderstanding around the information that's out there about diversity and inclusion. So we're going to somewhat unlearn the misinformation that's out there. Secondly, I wanna give each of us an opportunity to express pride in the groups in which we belong to. I think that oftentimes we feel that when we go to the marketplace, we have to leave our identities aside, but that's not what helps us to be the best that we can in the marketplace. So we're gonna take some opportunities to express pride in all the different identity groups that, that um, we are very proud to belong to. We're going to learn the personal impact of exclusion. We talk about how we need to foster inclusion, but a way to foster inclusion, to be mindful about that work, is to understand what are the implications of exclusion and what does that look like so we can spot it in order to be able to change the outcome of those circumstances. And then we're going to learn how to become better allies and advocates, particularly of those who are different from us. And so we're going to talk about how to do that. Expectations and agreements. So just like with any type of learning environment, we always want to make sure that we are preparing the learning environment so that learning can take place and that learning is enhanced. And so there's a couple expectations and agreements that I'll ask each of us to be mindful of. The first is please consider this as a very safe space. There are no wrong questions. There are no bad answers. We are here to learn from each other. And so I want you to follow your curiosity. Allow yourself to be transparent and honest as we engage each other around this very important topic. This is going to be very experiential and a focused process, and so there will be some interactivity that we will implement, and I ask that you will fully engage and allow yourselves to, again, make sure that you are getting the most benefit from the learning experience. The third one is to speak for self. And the reason that I always include that is because oftentimes, very unconsciously, when we're sharing and contributing information to the a conversation, sometimes the tendency is to speak for a group of individuals versus present our own individual perspective and point of view. So what I ask that you do today is that when you do contribute to the conversation, make sure you're speaking for self and not making the assumption that the way in which you're thinking or the lens in which you have about that subject is something that's shared among others, even though it very well may be. Formal roles left outside the door. Now, for the sake of time today, we're not gonna go around and do introductions because I suspect that many of you, hopefully all of you, know each other because you work together. But normally what I like to do is go around and have everyone to share their name, their title, and in what capacity in which they serve in the organization. And then once we've done that, it gives us the freedom to then say, now we're going to leave all of those formal roles outside the door 
so that we then can really focus on the learning environment. And what helps us to do that is when we all are approaching it as peers. So again, there's, there's clear transparency across the board. So what we're gonna do today is leave all of our formal roles outside of the door. We're going to embrace teachable moments. There are gonna be times today that we're gonna talk about subjects and things that you may be curious about, maybe you didn't know about prior to the conversations today. And you know, I want you to follow your curiosity. That is the best way that we can learn. And so in doing so, there could be an opportunity where myself or maybe someone else even sees an opportunity for learning to occur. And so we're going to give permission to each of us to exercise the right to have learning occur by treating those as teachable moments. So if I could have a show of hands for everyone that's in agreement with all of our expectations and agreements today, I would really appreciate it. Great, thank you kindly. A couple few more and then we'll definitely get into our skills training today. Fully engaged, so active participation leads to practical application and relevant skills training. And so we will certainly have opportunity for you to do that. We're also going to ask that each of you extend grace and accept grace. And here's what I mean by that. I may say something today, or someone else may say something today, and could be very well intended. And sometimes, outside of the context of us really trying to learn about this subject, we may perceive that information or that comment to be a little offensive. But our intent today is positive, because we're here to learn. So in that regard, I wanna ask that each of us extend grace and accept grace where needed, so that we can, again, have a very safe environment, transparent learning opportunity here. Remain open and curious, and then I want you all to commit to seeing a new modified way of thinking. I'm going to challenge you a little bit today, but it's, again, it's for the benefit of helping us all to get on greater common ground around this work of diversity and inclusion. So again, can I see a show of hands for each of you that agree to all of our expectations and our agreements? Fantastic. So let's start. Okay, so I really believe in the importance of language. I think that oftentimes the reason that there's so much misinformation out there is because we don't take the time to really create that common language and common way in which we define terminology. And so that's what we're gonna do right now. And I wanna start with the term diversity. So when diversity and inclusion practitioners first came on the scene years and years ago, this is how they defined diversity. The political and social policy of encouraging tolerance for people of different backgrounds. They went to market with this topic and with this definition, and they said, this is how we define it. No one questioned it, everyone just adopted it and said universally, this makes sense to us. It's all about tolerance of people that are different from us. And this was universally accepted. And then all of a sudden, they started thinking about that word tolerance. And they had some banter, some conversations around it, and they thought, you know what? Tolerance. I'm not quite sure if that's the connotation that we want people to have when they engage in conversations around diversity. And so, what is your name? Jessica, so if Jessica says to me, Nika, maybe after this, let's go and have drinks, let's go and have dinner, we'll love to kind of talk with you further. And I say, yes, Jessica, that's fantastic, let's do that. And then what if Jessica says, what's your name? Ladidra. Ladidra. What if Jessica then says, well, I heard Ladidra say that she would like to go and have drinks as well and just kind of hang out, can she come along? And I say, well, yes, Ladidra can come along, I'll tolerate her. <laughs> if she overheard that conversation, how do you think that she would feel? Would she feel welcomed? Would she feel like she's really invited and we really want her to be in our, in our presence? At least me, because I'm the one who said it. I don't think so. We tolerate things that are burdensome to us. We tolerate things because we feel like we have to, but not because we want to, and we welcome that experience to be in their company. And so no one wants to be tolerated. So all of those diversity and inclusion practitioners that realize, okay, this is a blind spot here. We miss this one. This is not how we want people to define diversity, because it's not about tolerance. So let's try this again. And then this is what they came up with as a definition of diversity. Fairness, equality, respect, and inclusion for women and people of color or other minority groups. And they went to market with this message. And everyone accepted it. It was pretty much universally accepted. Everyone started talking about diversity in this regard. It's for fairness and equality of people of color, minorities, women. And then what do you think happened? Safe environment. What do you think happened? Who was left out? What kind of men? White, white men. <laughs> yes, white men. White men quickly raise their hand and they say, yes, you know, I want women and people of color and minority groups to have fairness and be treated with equality and respect. And, but what about me? You completely left me out of the equation. I want those things too. Why am I not being considered? 
So the DNI practitioners went back to the drawing board and they said, okay, this is not going to work. We didn't mean to leave people out. Well intended, because we really wanted to focus on those that we deemed to be marginalized, disenfranchised, lack of opportunity, but it created this unintended consequence that they had to fix. So they said, okay, it's not at all about just these groups and these groups only. It is bigger than that. And this is where they landed. Diversity is simply a point of respect in which things differ. It is very relational in nature and you have to have more than one thing in order to have a relationship, right? And so it's not about the optics of race, age, and gender. It is about difference. And there are a multitude of differences that exist in the human population of people, very much so. And it's much broader. And so we have to become much more sophisticated in how in which we talk about and define diversity, because it is broader. In fact, this next graph shows just how broad it is. So here you see the protected categories in the US. And they're the pretty standard categories that we would think of. Again, a lot of them are optics. Gender, age, race, sexual orientation, ethnicity, even mental and physical ability and characteristics. Those are protected classes. But if you take it a step further, then you see that there's also a multitude of other layers of diversity that we just don't think about on a normal basis. And so we have here your education, your parental status, your geographic location, thinking styles, political affiliation, the list goes on and on. And so we have to make sure that we're talking about diversity much broader than what sometimes conversations will lead us to think that it is, because it is much broader. Now, I never talk about diversity without defining inclusion. So I want to talk about inclusion for a second, because again, we've already established that inclusion is where we place most of our emphasis. And I, again, I commend you all for having learned that a long time ago and being able to put that into practice. This is how I define inclusion. It is intentionality in bringing together and leveraging differences in a way that is beneficial, that's the optimal word, to a process or group in pursuit of organizational objectives. So it is very action oriented. You cannot be passive about the work of inclusion. It has a certain look about it. It is deliberate, it is strategic, it has forethought. And you're constantly thinking about how can I create an environment where people really feel welcome, accepted, and like that they belong. And so this is how we define inclusion. There was a study that was done. My doctorate is actually in management organizational leadership, so I love data. So every time I have an opportunity to share with an audience, I always try to incorporate some of that data because you really can't argue with facts. And I think it's important to bring facts to this conversation. And so this is what this study did. They surveyed thousands of individuals across several different Fortune 500 companies. And they were asking them, so what does inclusion look like to you? And these were individuals who were part of organizations that have very, um, they're very vocal about their leadership in the space of diversity and inclusion. And here's what they had to say, being at home. So I don't know about you all, but when I'm at home, I am very comfortable. I don't have to question or wonder if I'm accepted or welcome. That is my domain. I am at home. So that's what inclusion feels like to a lot of individuals. Belonging. There's a lot of talk about authenticity and belonging around the subject of diversity and inclusion. And in fact, we're going to spend some time on that today. But the point that I want to make at this juncture in the presentation is this. It is hard for a person to show up as their best in an organization if they're always questioning whether or not they belong. I want to say that again. It is hard for a person to show up at their best, as their best, in an organization if they're always questioning whether or not they belong. Now, why is that important? It's important because we exist in organizations where we rely on our teammates to show up for us every single day, given their best. And they can't do that if they feel like they're always questioning whether or not, do I belong here? Am I accepted here? Am I valued here? So we have to help create that type of environment for those individuals because, again, we depend on them. And our ability to depend on them to deliver is greatly tied to our ability to produce high-performing teams and high-performing organizations. And so belonging is very important. Able to bring my whole self to fill in the blank. It could be work. It could be community. It could be wherever the case may be. But I'm able to bring my whole self, which means that before I walk out the door, I don't have to take portions of my identity and place it on the mantle and then walk out the door. Only to arrive back home at my home and then pick back up all those identities and then to feel whole again. But I can feel whole the moment that I walk out that door because I know that whatever environment I'm going into, I can bring my whole authentic self to that environment. Feeling that my unique contribution was valued. My perspective is always considered. I have a say in what happens. And lastly, everyone counts, but most importantly, everyone knows that they count. Let me tell you the significance of this last statement. 
I know of a lot of organizations where the leader will go to market, they'll put it on their website, they're very vocal about the fact that we embrace diversity, we believe in diversity and inclusion, it's very important to our organization, and they say that we have a very inclusive environment. But if the people within that organization cannot say the same, then it's questionable really whether or not you can confidently say that, strictly because I can feel like the environment is very welcoming and accepting, but then if you go around and you do an assessment and you ask others, and they will say, well, no, I, I really don't feel like my contribution is valued, or that I'm considered, or that I'm welcomed and invited in this place. I feel like I have to put on a facade or conform to the mainstream dominant culture in the organization, and that's not indicative of an inclusive environment. So I always say that this is important because you have to make sure that everyone knows that they count, that they can also say, yes, this is an inclusive environment. So the bottom line is this, diversity and inclusion. Organizations have to have both. They live and exist together. You can't separate them. They absolutely have to be able to work in concert with each other. And so here's another way to define diversity and inclusion. It's bringing people with different experiences to the table, and inclusion is inviting people and encouraging them to lead, to speak and to lead and to contribute. So they go hand in hand, like peanut butter and jelly, like Michelle and Barack Obama. You can't separate them. Keep them together, okay? So now, Verne Myers is an authority that's in this space of diversity and inclusion, and she came up with this as an analogy to define diversity and inclusion. She said diversity is inviting everyone to the party. Everyone gets an invitation. So everyone across the room gets an invitation. But then inclusion is, once everybody's at the party, everyone is asked to dance. Everyone is asked, would you like a cup of punch? Everyone is being invited into conversations and provided introductions to other individuals that are there in that space and environment as well. And if you were to get that visual in your head of this party environment, doesn't that look like inclusion? Doesn't that look like acceptance and welcoming? It should, because that's what it is. But it requires work. So when people say to me, well, I embrace diversity, I value diversity, and I welcome diversity, they're well-intended, I know what they mean, and I can really appreciate that. But if we go back to how in which we define diversity, which again is a point of respect in which things differ, what we have to realize is that we don't have to do anything to welcome or invite diversity. It's already here and happening. We can have a room of a group of homogenous individuals. They all look alike and still have diversity. And so inclusion is what is most important. And I'm probably preaching to the choir right now because you all have got that. And again, I commend you on that. So let's go a little bit deeper. Here are some DNI philosophies that I feel like are very foundational to uh, training sessions where we're really trying to operate at a high level in this work of inclusion. The first is being inclusion-minded is a leadership function. So let me ask you, how many of you in here are responsible for the work of inclusion within your respective organization? Okay, I see a hand here, I see a hand here, I see a couple hands go up. Okay, so for the rest of you who did not put your hand in the air, I want to ask why. And as you ponder that question, I want you to think about that first statement on this slide. Being inclusion-minded is a leadership function. If you are a leader in your organization, which strictly just means that you have a level of influence within your organization, then you have the ability to lead change, which means that you also have the ability to make sure that you are exercising your inclusion muscle in order to foster an environment of inclusion, where everyone feels welcome and like they belong. So I'm gonna ask the question again, how many of you in here are responsible for the work of inclusion within your respective organizations? And all hands go up, thank you, point well taken, I appreciate that. Now, diversity is a growth capability. The same way that we will identify opportunities for professional development, so that we can grow in our ability to manage people, to manage conflict, to make sure that we have effective communication styles and practices. That's how we need to view the work of inclusion because if we're not mindful about it and intentional about it, it's not gonna happen at an effective high level. So we have to make sure that again, we're exercising our inclusion muscle and we're looking to grow and learn. And in that regard, it is a growth capability. It is a professional development opportunity. Diversity and inclusion is valuing an effective management of human difference. If it were up to me, and I say this often and people get really wide eyes, but if it were up to me, I would totally eradicate the words diversity and inclusion. And here's why. I feel like it's lost its power. 
I feel like people now in organizations toss it around as these sexy buzzwords because it's the right thing to do, it's the right speak to have into our branding materials, but the true essence of how to operate upon that and execute and practice diversity and inclusion, I feel like it's misunderstood oftentimes. And so for me, I would rather talk about it in the sense of effective management and valuing of human difference, all types of human difference, including all those different mini layers that we saw in a previous slide. So it's just valuing and effective management of human difference. And that's how sometimes we have to look at it in order to break through to those who, again, maybe they're just tired of hearing the words diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion, because they really don't fully understand what it is. What looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity. We have to be willing and able to have conversations, and sometimes even courageous, tough conversations. Because part of the resistance for people is that they don't understand it. And if they don't understand it, it's going to be hard for them to really try to interact and learn more about it and gravitate towards, again, this growth capability, opportunity that's before them. So we have to help them to conclude why it's important and give them clarity. And then people are well-intended. I truly believe this. I think that oftentimes, those who are maybe not believers of this space, it's not because they really can't find the capacity to try to value this work or even understand it. It's just that people don't know what they don't know. So sometimes someone may say something or do something that seems contrary to the work of inclusion because they don't realize how their actions, their behaviors, and their thoughts could have implications, negative implications, to the workplace. And so, we can't just assume that they have ill intent. We have to help educate people, and that's what I believe. Diversity equals difference. Not more than, not less than, not inferior, not inferior, or superior. It just means that it is different, and we have to think about it in that regard. Skills training leads to empowerment, and it allows us to be equipped to deal with these situations on the individual level. What happens is, is that oftentimes people will see the work of diversity and inclusion as the responsibility of HR professionals or of those individuals that actually carry the title of DNI officer or DNI manager or practitioner. And we have to make sure that we're not thinking about it in that regard. It's much bigger and it's much broader than that. So, it's for everyone. The reason I say that it's for everyone is because I've done sessions before where the room was pretty homogenous. Maybe it's been for the African American Network group, or maybe it's been for a women's group. And oftentimes the notion is, well, I'm a minority, and so I live this work every single day, so I don't need skills training around it. And then I always say, no, 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 we all need it, because we all have biases. And I will show you exactly how unconscious biases and implicit bias, which is also how it's referred to, shows up oftentimes in a way that we don't even realize, and then it ends up in some negative impact implications. Every issue counts. Listening does not mean agreement. That's the philosophical foundation. Sometimes we feel as though if I engage in dialogue with someone about a topic that I really don't agree in, or maybe those values don't match my values, that now I'm going to be perceived as now that's part of my values and my lifestyle. And that's not the case. Listening does not mean agreement. And in fact, active listening is one of the best things that we can do as individuals to help grow in our capacity to be inclusion-minded. And then to shift attitudes, we must hear, share stories. Sharing stories, it puts us at a place of vulnerability. And that place of vulnerability, it gives us empathy, and it gives us the ability to better become active listeners, and to, again, break down maybe some of those silos or some of those mindsets that prevents us from being able to see another perspective that's different from our own. And so sometimes we have to allow ourselves to engage in hearing those stories. Instead of just assuming, ask questions to get the other person talking and engaging with you. And through that dialogue, you'll find that you just may learn something that then opens up your eyes and causes your lens to change a little bit. And then maybe also that same thing is happening on the other end. So dialogue is really key for this work. So here are some drivers of diversity and inclusion. And when I say drivers, here are some key motivators that's causing organizations to be even more aggressive and assertive in their leadership role around the work of diversity and inclusion. First is changing demographics worldwide in America. There's this wonderful text by a gentleman by the name of Dr. William Fry. He's out of the Brookings Institute, and he has wrote this book um, called The Diversity Explosion. And it's where he takes and it compiles all of this great data and research that's been conducted around how literally there is going to be a changing face of America, and actually it's happening right now. And so much so to where he goes in depth into dealing with the economic implications, the social implications, the implications to the workplace, and it's very compelling. And so if you have some believers in your circle that you want to make believers, introduce them to this text. Again, it's called Diversity Explosion. But we are seeing that we're soon going to get to a place where there's no racial majority. It's happening right before our eyes. The millennial population is the largest group in the workforce right now. 
and they are very multicultural and they are very inclusion minded. And guess what? They are producing multicultural babies, which means the cycle is continuing. So we have to recognize that. So changing face and changing demographics worldwide is certainly a driver of diversity and inclusion. Increased generational mix. We have actually five generations in the workplace right now. And if you think that's not creating some impact, it truly is. It truly is. Ongoing war for future top talent. So we've shared today that part of my background is working with the client. They're one of my largest, my lar my larger, largest um, clients. And the Greenville Chamber, and what they do is we do a lot of work around workforce development. And a topic that keeps us up at night, because it keeps a lot of our business members up at night, is the issue of workforce or the lack thereof. We have jobs that are going on field. And so right now the workforce is very competitive. And if your organization is not one that is poised to be able to attract talent, because you're seen as progressive, as inclusive, and as an environment that's very accepting where opportunity for all exists, then you're gonna be missing out potentially on some great talent. And so the war on talent is obviously a driver of diversity and inclusion. Clients and customer expectations. When I worked at um, Urban Penland Advertising, one of the things that I was often called in to assist with would be pitches for different client prospects. And when, even when we, we would receive the RFI, the request for information, part of what those prospective clients wanted to know is who's gonna be working on my account? What are the demographics of those individuals? Why do you think they wanted to know that? Anyone, why do you think that was important to them? What were they seeking to gain by that information? Yes, they wanted to know who's working on my account because what I, why that's important to me is because this business, my consumer, looks like diverse America. And if the people that are working on my account are not reflective of those that we service every single day, there is a disconnect. And so there was a business reason why we needed to be very effective and intentional in our approach about diversifying the workforce. And so client and customer expectation certainly is a driver of diversity and inclusion. Societal and cultural shifts, growing multiracial and identity categories, and then complex social issues. If we do not believe that what's happening on a social level right now, outside of the four walls of our workplace, is impacting how and which people show up in the workplace, that we are very misguided because those conversations are being had and there are implications to how in which people are viewing those social issues. So much so to where there are a lot of large corporations they have built into their, their model and their service offering to just allow these town hall meetings where they put people in a room who want to, to go just to share their thoughts, their concerns, and they give them that platform to do that. And that's important because to them they recognize this is impacting them. So while we can't change what's happening socially, at least not you know, with all these systemic issues on our own as an organization, we can at least send a message to our people that we understand that this is happening and that this could be impacting you. And we want to acknowledge that and give you space to talk about it. And that's been important. So again, a lot of the complex social issues are certainly finding its way into the motivators behind driving diversity and inclusion within organizations. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is really shift the paradigm. I talked about the fact that we need to have a new mindset, a new way of thinking about this work. And here's what it boils down to. Many organizations, they enter into the work of diversity and inclusion for obligation reasons. And when they do that, the question is what the organization can do or should do to advance diversity and inclusion. But if you shift that and you see the work of diversity and inclusion as an opportunity, then the question becomes this. What can diversity and inclusion do to advance the organization? There is a shift in paradigm. Do you see it? Obligation versus opportunity. And that's how we have to think about it. Are there any questions about that before I move on to the next segment, which deals with authenticity and belongingness? Thoughts and questions? Okay. So I mentioned earlier that um, authenticity and belongingness is really important to this discussion because it has a lot to do with the, the nature of how in which the environment is viewed as inclus inclusive or not. And if an environment is really fostering inclusion, then it causes people to feel like they have a sense of belonging, that they can bring their authentic selves to the marketplace. And so why does fostering difference make a difference? Here's why. Oftentimes, if people feel like they can't, again, bring their authentic selves to the marketplace, this is what you'll see happening. They will self-censor. And we don't want people to self-censor or to conform with the dominant culture in terms of how they're thinking, how they're behaving, because if everyone's thinking alike, then right, no one's thinking, right? 
No one's thinking. So we need for people to bring their diversity of thought to the marketplace because that's what breeds innovation. That's what helps us to be better problem solvers and decision makers, and so we need that. So they will either downplay their differences, they will conform, or they'll play into the expectations. This group wants me to view this in this light, so that's what I'm going to say, regardless of whether or not I believe that that's true. And then we're missing out on great, again, intellect and very healthy debate and conflict and banner that could lead to wonderful outcomes. So there was a study that was done where 3,000 employees in 20 large US organizations across 10 different industries were leveraged for this study. Each organization had a stated commitment to inclusion on their website. So they had demonstrated leadership as to how in which they viewed and practiced the work of inclusion. Yet, 61% of the survey participants said they had faced overt or implicit pressure to cover in some way or to downplay their differences from the mainstream. 66% of these employees said that it significantly undermined their sense of self, and then 50% said that it diminished their sense of commitment. This is a survey, this is data, these are facts. These are people that were able to be very transparent in an anonymous survey to say, okay, how is this showing up for you? And what's even more interesting is that, again, as I started, we're talking about organizations that had very explicit statements of support and leadership around the work of diversity and inclusion. But yet and still, a lot of these people had these thoughts. Additionally, 29% altered their attire, grooming, or mannerisms to make their identity less obvious. 40% refrained from behavior that's commonly associated with the given identity. 57% avoided sticking up for their identity group, and then 18 limited contact with the group in which they belong. Just ponder that for a second. These are real situations. These are real decisions that people are having to make day in and day out as they walk into the workplace. We have to recognize that that impacts how in which people show up in the workplace. And again, it can negatively impact their ability to, again, bring their best, bring their best and allowing us to rely on their best. And so why is this even important? It's important because it creates dysfunction, dysfunctional agreement and dysfunctional disagreement, and they both are very toxic. Let me show you how. So dysfunctional disagreement. This is when it's an us versus them syndrome. You clearly know that you're in an organization where there's contention. There's just a lot of lack of trust. There's always disagreements. There's this personal conflict. And people can feel that tension. That is clearly dysfunctional disagreement. On the opposite end of that, you have dysfunctional agreement. This is where it's a lack of honesty. No one's being transparent. Um, there's a, people avoiding conflict because they can't be honest. And they're just always <laughs> agreeing and just conforming, just to kind of, let's get through this meeting and move on to the next thing, because that's what people want to hear anyways. So let me just go ahead and conform. And then it ends up being the meeting before the meeting to talk about what needs to happen in the meeting, or the meeting after the meeting to talk about what should have happened in the meeting, or who should have been in the meeting that wasn't in the meeting because that person wasn't invited because they were excluded. These are real life situations that happen in a lot of environments, and they both are very toxic. So how do we address this dysfunction? We do so by placing emphasis on uniqueness and on belongingness. There goes that word again, belongingness. And here's how we do it. So on this matrix, you'll see that we chart low and high uniqueness and low and high belongingness. This is where we always want to be, in this box right here, which is the box of inclusion. So, the box of inclusion says individual is treated as an insider and also allowed and encouraged to retain uniqueness within the work group. That's where we want everyone to be. The complete opposite of that box is the exclusion box. And this is when the individual is not treated as an organizational insider with unique value in the work group, but there are clearly are other employees who are part of the in group. And we pretty much can spot them. We know that he's in the in group or she's in the in group. And they have the code of success, which means there's greater opportunity and the conditions are right for them to be successful and for the rest of us to be left behind. That's not what you want. Where I find that most organizations will have um, greater propensity to, to pitch their tent, and sometimes it's not intentional, it's just they're not thinking about it, would be either in differentiation or in assimilation. And differentiation is high value in uniqueness, but it's low value in belongingness. And here's what it states. The individual is not treated as an organizational insider in the work group, but their unique characteristics are seen as valuable and required for group and organizational success. And then assimilation is individuals treated as an insider in the work group when they conform to organization or the dominant culture norms and they downplay their uniqueness. So we have to make sure that we are being very intentional to consider how are we helping people to show up to where this environment and this space causes them to feel like it is one that is very inclusive. And we have the responsibility of that. 
because again, regardless of our titles and the role that we play in the organizations, we all are scheduling meetings. We all are convening people for around common projects and goals. And so let's think about who's not here and what type of parameters do we need to have in place to make sure that everybody can contribute at their best. And that's something that all of us can do. So I want to pause here for a second. What questions do you have about that? What we've done just now is really just laid the foundation around what this is, what it's not, how it shows up, and why it's important in the business case for it. What I'm going to move into next, after I take any questions that you have, is how do we each now start this journey of becoming an intentional inclusionist, which is where we are very intentional about creating and fostering this environment where our behaviors and everything about the environment that we dwell in is very inclusive. What questions or thoughts do you have? Are you all still tracking with me? Okay, so something that I'm going to ask that Johnny will do is, do you have those handouts or someone has those handouts? Okay, so Johnny is going to pass out a handout. This is eight and a half by 11 sheet. This is um, an assessment. And at the top it says, how are you showing up as an intentional inclusionist? And what I'm going to do is as I talk through each one of these characteristics of intentional inclusionists, I want you to rate yourselves. At the top it has the, the, the legend for um, the rating scale and it's one to five. And I want you to be very reflective, very honest, and, um, and again, no one's gonna take these up, these are just for you, but it's a moment of reflection. And as those are being handed out, let me tell you why this is important. I feel as though, as leaders, we are very intentional to help evaluate ourselves around several different topics, soft skills, leadership skills, et cetera. And we do that because we wanna be able to understand where we need to improve, where we need to refine our abilities in that regard, so that we can put forth now some type of actionable plan towards improving ourselves and our leadership in that ability. But what I find is that not a lot of people, not a lot of leaders in particular, have taken the time to do that as it relates to how in which they show up as an inclusion-minded leader. And so this gives you an opportunity to reflect on that. Now, here's something that I will share with you. Um, rating yourself in this regard, there's no right or wrong, it's just where you are. It's just really, you know, again, providing an honest assessment. And then what I want to do is try to add some skills training so that as you identify the areas in which you would like to grow, that now you are equipped and empowered to do so. So I wrote this book, The Intentional Inclusionist. Um, I actually wrote it the, I don't know, the end of last year. It was published earlier this year. And I wrote it very specifically for leaders. And so as I was thinking about the audience of this book, one of the things that I recognize is that leaders can appreciate and value the fact that diversity and inclusion exist maybe within their organizations or within different circles in which they dwell, but they also can be very passive about it. Passive in the sense that while I'm glad that it's happening, I don't see myself as part of the solution to help create that inclusion. I'm just expecting someone else to facilitate that. And I felt that the population of people that fit that category is so much greater than the individuals that are very deliberately deciding to live a life of prejudice or racism or hatred, um, where they are really intentionally trying to exclude people. And so rather than focus on those individuals who oftentimes you probably can't change their, their, their thinking or their attitudes anyway, let me focus on the leaders who are passive about this work and get them engaged at a high level. And in doing so, I feel like we really can tackle this work in a much more effective way. So that's who I'm talking to. There are two main premises of this book before we get into the characteristics and you start rating yourselves. The first is you have to be intentional. This work does not happen organically. There is tremendous power in intentionality. Regardless if we're talking about diversity and inclusion or any other success story that you're trying to create for yourself, if we exercise intention behind it, that automatically gives us greater propensity to reach our goals. And I want us to view the work of inclusion the same way. The second premise of this book is that, again, we've already talked about this, but it's worth emphasizing. Being inclusion-minded is a leadership function. So it is a leadership capability, regardless of who you are and what background and what title and what position that you hold. And so if we view it as a leadership function, then I truly believe that leaders will become more intentional about trying to exercise this work in an effective way. So are you with me? So here's the first characteristics of an intentional inclusionist. They practice mindfulness and situational awareness. 
So they are constantly thinking about walking into a room, kind of scanning the environment. They are really exercising emotional intelligence. They have great situational awareness. They're constantly thinking about who's not at the table. But it's that level of mindfulness that allows us to have our antennas up to where we can recognize and spot when exclusion is happening or when there's a threat to inclusion. And if we know that, then we have greater propensity to try to put some action in place to change that, right? So we have to be mindful. We have to practice situational awareness. Secondly, we have to recognize that there is a difference between equality and equity. And too many people use them synonymously, and they are very different. And an intentional inclusion is recognize the difference and the significance of making sure that people are educated on the difference. Let me show you what this looks like. So this graph shows a visual. And it shows where, on one side, is defining equality. And you see this is where everybody is given the same thing to presumably be successful. And the success in this regard is reaching the apple on the tree. But that success can look like so many different things in real life. But for analogy's sake, this is about reaching the apple on the tree. So you have, on the opposite side, a way to define equity. And equity is not when you give everybody the same thing to be successful, but it's when you give everybody what they need to be successful. You see the difference? And so intentional inclusionists recognize that difference, and they exercise knowledge of that difference as they're making decisions, as they're interacting, and as they're showing up in the workplace. So we have to make sure that we recognize that as well. So make sure you're rating yourself on that. Intentional inclusionists, they have a keen sense of responsibility for change. They are change agents. They recognize that if we continue to do the same thing over and over again, we're going to get the same results. So we have to step out of our bubble, step out of our box, and be willing to exercise change and to manage that change effectively for the sake of good outcomes. And so they're change agents. Rate yourself. They're a student of human difference. They have a passion for learning, and particularly for learning about other cultures that are different from theirs, understanding those cultures, how in which those cultures kind of show up in the world, and, and, and understanding those differences. You know, it's, it's interesting to me how I have a lot of individuals that will say, well, I want to learn about other individuals and cultures. I just don't know. I've never had an experience with, with, with that culture or, or those types of individuals, and I just don't know. And that's fine, and that's, I'm sure, true in many regards. And we don't always have the ability to go and learn everything about everybody that's different from us. But here's what I do challenge people on. When you recognize that you want to know something because it's part of your leadership capability, and it's part of how you show up as a leader, then what do you do? You find ways to learn that information, right? There are way too many webinars, books, consultants, people. Cons I mean, just the list goes on and on. White papers, blogs, for you to learn about conversations, for you to learn about others, for us to use the excuse that, well, I just don't know. And intentional inclusionists recognize that if you just don't know, you figure out how to know, and you get that knowledge. They engage in respectful questioning, and they're comfortable challenging existing practices. If you see something, say something. We live in this world, I truly believe, to where we deem that even if we witness like, some type of microaggression taking place, and we'll talk about microaggressions in a second, or if we witness exclusion taking place, we may even shake our head in shame, feeling a little bit like I hate that that happened. But sometimes we need to go to action. We need to take that step further and not just think to ourselves, this is shameful. But if you see something, say something. I'm not saying go and embarrass people, but treat it as a teachable moment. Treat it as an opportunity to say, I know that you may have been well-intended, but let me share with you how this landed on so-and-so. We have to be willing to do that as intentional inclusionists. You see something, say something. If you see a practice or a policy in place that's leading to exclusion, then say something. Because nine times out of 10, maybe the person who implemented that policy or is enforcing that policy, maybe they don't even know that it's creating a situation where exclusion could be occurring. So we have to say something. Routinely leverage diversity in thinking for effective collaboration. So diversity in thought is one of the greatest assets of diversity that I feel like is very underutilized. It is an asset that I feel like most organizations do not truly leverage to its full potential. And what that looks like is, again, I mentioned before, we all are convening people in groups. Are we asking questions about who should be in this meeting, who should be in the room, or are we going to the normal suspects? You know, there was a situation at the chamber where I was involved in a conversation, and we were trying to identify someone to take on a very specific role of a project that was pretty significant. And I actually mentioned someone's name. And um, one of the other leaders said, I never thought about that person. Hmm, I don't know. I never thought about that person. And I said, that's why I mentioned their name, because you never thought about them. So just because they're unassuming 
does not mean that they're not capable and willing. Give people a chance. That is the mindset of an intentional inclusionist. They realize every person and every issue counts. The reason that I talked in the beginning about the fact that everyone has to also feel like they count is for this very reason. An intentional inclusionist recognizes that we cannot pinpoint which issues that we deem to be important enough to make as part of a conversation of inclusion. Every issue needs to count. And we need to make sure that we're exercising a great deal of latitude and giving people the freedom to say, this is a concern to me. And if nothing else, listen with empathy and support. That's creating a sense of belongingness and acceptance and value and inclusion. Practice humility, admit mistakes, and ask for feedback. And the last portion of that, to me, is the most important, which is assume positive intent. Sometimes we have the, as human nature, we can input meaning into people's comments and behaviors. And sometimes, if you were really just to pause and reflect, maybe that person didn't have any kind of ill intent at all. Maybe it was just they were blindsided. Maybe they were just ignorant to the, the information. And so the reason this is important is because if we don't assume that people come from a place of positive intent, when we start to engage them, we do so with a bias. We do so with a sense of assumption. And oftentimes those assumptions are negative, which means it could cause us to have aggression to be met with aggression. And the bottom line is to keep the conversation going because if the conversation ends, then what happens? We have no chance for us to be able to have some kind of healthy dialogue to help us see each other's perspectives. So we have to make sure that we are engaging in very healthy, robust dialogue and assuming positive intent. We have to exercise global fluency and be interculturally competent. Here's why this is important. Right now, one of the main differentiators in the marketplace in terms of having someone to have an edge up over another candidate is their global fluency, their ability to be interculturally competent, recognizing that so many organizations right now in our community and in the marketplace, they have a global presence. And so we have to make sure that we are approaching it in that regard too, which goes back to, again, us being very mindful and have an interest and curiosity about human difference and learning about human difference. They're proactive in finding ways to create safe space for all to contribute and feel valued. That's why I started our conversation by saying this is a safe space. I want everybody to contribute and feel valued. No one issue or person in this room is more important than the next. An endpoint does not exist to the work of inclusion. It is a journey, not a destination, and even that journey, the points within the journey are constantly moving, so we have to move with it. Are you rating yourselves? How are you doing? I want to make sure you're rating yourselves. This is a reflection moment for each of us to see how we're showing up. Leverage teachable moments. We're ally and advocates of others, particularly those that are different from us. So let me just give you an example of how this can show up very effectively in the workplace. There are a lot of companies that have employee resource groups or business resource groups. They're also known as affinity groups. And it could be groups that where um, individuals that have common identities will coalesce for support and for different development opportunities. Uh, so it could be women's groups, African American groups, Latino American groups. Um, where I find that there's greater opportunity for organizations to be even more intentional and effective in their efforts to foster strong employee resource groups is when others that are not a part of that identity group become involved and become allies and advocates. It pains me to go to a women's event where we're talking about trying to increase and, and bridge the gap of the disparity in high-level senior roles and corporate board positions for women, and I look in the audience and I see all women. Don't we realize that oftentimes it's the men that are in those positions of influence in organizations that can open the doors, create the opportunities, mentor, sponsor, change the culture? So why are we not being intentional to invite those men so they can be allies and advocates? So again, we have to think about that. They're allies and advocates of others, particularly those who are different from them. They understand the significance of intersectionality. How many of you heard that word before? I know some of you have because we talked about it in the, um, the small group session that we did with the IND group and the Impact Council. So let me tell you what intersectionality is. So as a female, um, we know that, by, by, this is facts, statistics show that there's still a huge disparity in terms of women being able to have their rightful place in corporate America, particularly in those senior level positions and on corporate boards. And so I'm a female, so also I have the threat of some type of discrimination or sexism based upon the fact that I'm a female, my gender. I'm also an African American female. And because I'm an African American, there are also opportunities where threat could exist as well for discrimination. 
And so what intersectionality says is that there are individuals in our society that have multiple identities that are perceived to be disenfranchised and marginalized, historically speaking. And so that means that automatically their situation is at a higher threat for not being able to realize their full potential. And so the reason this has become important to the conversation of diversity and inclusion is because, again, we have a lot of groups that are forming to serve as allies and advocates of certain groups. But what they need to recognize and what intersection, intersectionality encourages us to recognize is that we all need to be advocating for each other because all of those groups that are trying to push for their own agenda to make sure that they are being treated fairly and with equity and, and they have opportunities afforded to them exist within those other groups as well. So why not, instead of being siloed and advocating for one group over the other, why don't we band together and have this cross-pollination? And thereby, through that exercise, we have greater impact to overcome some of the level of oppression and discrimination that exists. And intentional inclusionists recognize the significance of intersectionality. So rate yourself on that. They have a high level of social consciousness, and they are courageous in standing up for what's right. If you see something, say something. They don't mind standing up for it. That's what intentional inclusionists will do. They recognize the need to minimize both people bias and process bias, and they're comfortable respectfully challenging both. Now, we all know what people bias is, but I want to give you an example of what process bias is. So I get called upon and get bet from organizations that have board of directors, and they're really interested in diversifying their board because they recognize we service a lot of diverse constituents. But we don't know necessarily where to go to find a Latino American that have expertise in marketing communications, or maybe an African American male to round out that board that has experience in marketing or, or finance, whatever the case may be. And so they'll say, can you help us identify some strategies to really diversify our board, our volunteer leadership? And so I begin to ask questions because I want to understand what is your current process and procedure? And they will tell me that they have a subset of the board, the existing board, that is the nominating committee. And what that nominating committee will do is bring back recommendations to the larger board to vote on. And then that's how they pick the folks that are going to fill those seats. And so then I ask the question a little bit further because I'm curious about the fact that they just told me the board is not very diverse. And so if you have a subset of the board, then my assumption at this point in time, which I'm getting clarity on, is that that subset of the board that's serving as this nominating committee, they're probably a pretty homogenous group. And they say, yeah, pretty much they are. And so what happens is there's a bias in that process that they don't realize. It is a blind spot because we are creatures of habit. We don't mean any negative intent, but what we do as creatures of habit is we go to people who are in our circle, who are in our corner, who maybe go to church with us, who maybe live in our neighborhoods, people who like us, you know, they think like us, they, you know, they, people that are, look, they look like us. And what happens is we bring them forward as nominees, and then they get voted upon, and then you continue to have the sea of sameness. And so when I peel back the onion and I share that story with them, I'm able to help them recognize there's a bias in their process that they didn't even realize. You have to do something different if you want to get different results from what you have currently. And that's when we'll go into all these other strategies and I'll share with them. Have you thought about connecting with these diverse groups? And, but, it, but it helps to understand that there is bias in people and in processes and we have to make sure that as intentional inclusionists, we are recognizing both of them. And then the last one is they understand privilege. So here's the thing about privilege. I truly believe that we've gotten to a place in society to where privilege has been talked about in a very negative way. I don't feel like the full story has been told. The reality of privilege is this. We all have certain privileges. I have a number of privileges. As a well-abled body individual, I am afforded a privilege every single day that a subset of people in our community that are differently abled may not have. As an individual who grew up in a home with two parents and was supported by two parents, I have a level of privilege that many people in our society do not have. I have a level of privilege because I was afforded the opportunity to go and get an undergrad degree, and even go on to get a postgraduate degree. So that affords me a certain level of privilege. What I often get frustrated with is that we talk so much about white privilege without putting it into the context of how privilege exists in all of our lives in some capacity. And what I want us to do is to recognize that wherever we have privilege in each of our individual lives, we need to use it honorably in order to help others along that don't have the same level of opportunity that we have. And so I'm gonna pause here because I'm gonna show you a quick video that explains privilege and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about it. The winner of this race will take this. It's a $100 bill. Before I say go, 
I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I've said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly gonna win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. Have you heard privilege talked about? in that capacity before? Thoughts, reactions? The main takeaway for me from that video um, was really the notion that we all have a sense of responsibility. And again, I think that where privilege becomes negative is if we fail to acknowledge our privilege and we fail to use it honorably to help someone else along that may not have been afforded the same level of opportunity as us. And so I hope that if nothing else from that video, that would be one of the takeaways that you have as well. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on. And before I actually jump off, how did you do on your assessments? Are you feeling pretty good about where you are? You see some opportunities for refinement, for growth, learning? I'm seeing some heads nodding? Okay, great, fantastic. So those are yours to keep. Again, it's nothing, um, that we're going to take up, but it's really just for you to be reflective about how you're showing up as an intentional inclusionist. And I encourage you to identify ways in which you, know, you may want to help um, exercise that inclusion muscle. Are there, I want to pause now for a second to take any ideas that you have that could be very relevant to your organization around creating um, inclusive environment. 
Are there any ideas that you want to toss out for your colleagues to hear? Let me say, I don't mind silence, so we can sit here in silence, but I want somebody to say something, please. <laughs> I know you have ideas around this. I've just downloaded a lot of information to you about diversity and inclusion. So what do you see as an opportunity for your organization, maybe that's not already happening, to help create even further leadership around inclusion? But I think that's a good one. We have to learn from mistakes. What's another one? Thank you. Thank you for sharing, by the way. What else? What are some other opportunities that you see? <laughs> sure, awareness. And, and let me say this too, I know that I've already um, commended each of you, but I know that you don't have to be here today. And there's so many people that are in your organization that's not here today for, for a variety of reasons. And what I encourage you to do is the awareness and the education that you're getting, find an opportunity to be able to share some of this with maybe a peer of your colleagues, a teammate, but let's not let it end here. You know, there's a huge difference between activity and impact. You know, activity is you come to this event. Impact is you come to this event, you get knowledge, and now you can apply and you can share it with someone else so they can apply it. And so just be mindful of that. That's what an intentional inclusion will do. Okay, I want to put at least two or three more ideas up here. And we won't move on until we have at least five. So I need two or three more. What else? What else do you see as an opportunity within your organization? Mm-hmm. Yeah, recognizing ideas come from anywhere. What else? Yeah, you're fine. Mm-hmm. Um, from the perspective of helping and counting. Um, like I had a, a, a thing this past summer where I met a child that was in high school and that didn't even know what an accountant was. And I remember thinking, I'm, my parents didn't really know what an accountant was when I wanted to be an accountant. But they, they have resources to kind of help find information for me to find out if that's what I wanted to do or not. And sure. So it's, that would, that would be very rewarding for me because it's just that giving back and, and how much privilege there is in the world of public accounting, mm -hmm. it, it really blows your mind. Yeah, sure. Well, I think that's a great one. Um, and I want to take it a step further just to, to add this to the conversation. One of the things that I know is that a lot of industries are 
more challenging than others to diversify, just strictly because of the industry, the skill sets, things of that nature. And it could be that not a lot of people that are part of those underrepresented populations are even introduced to know about that as a career path. So what you're saying is tremendous. And I think that that does carry a, a lot of weight in terms of, if nothing else, just being mindful to introduce someone who may not have it on their radar, especially if part of this leadership role is to diversify you know, the organization and the industry. Now, yes. Yeah, that's huge. Just simple question of what is your experience? I think too often we assume and that gets us in trouble because those assumptions are not necessarily accurate. And then we base decisions off of those assumptions. And then, you know, again, we're just perpetuating this cycle where we're not able to really um, create the environment that we really want. And so, anyway, I love crowd sharing, so I want to give you a chance to share that. I didn't hear from this side of the room, so speak now. Anyone want to share before we move on? Yeah. You don't know who was worried they had to pay for consulting bills. You don't know who didn't have any of those passes sure. where they were going to help. Um, and how in our recruiting practices, so many things flow around how you check a box, like what's your GPA, what's your work experience, yeah. you know, how do you carry yourself in your interviews, and that all those things can be so impacted by how this past life experience has shaped you, but then it boils down to how do you check these couple boxes, and it's really hard to overlook those three boxes because that's really all I have to go on. But yeah. Of how you can even look at different, what are the door on the first step if they didn't check the boxes the way you initially wanted it to be. Sure. No, that's a very astute comment. I appreciate you sharing that. One of the best practices that I like to share with organizations, particularly as it relates to hiring practices, is you know sometimes, and this doesn't apply across the board, because obviously there are certain skill sets that are required in order to be able to do the job. But generally speaking, sometimes um, I think that we are less inclined to hire for talent and not a resume. We go strictly by what's on the resume. And I'll give you a prime example. When I mentioned before that I spent a number of years working in marketing communications, we were having a hard time diversifying because we were traditionally going to those individuals that graduated from very traditional marketing, <coughs> communications, advertising, PR programs. But what we realized is that if we continue to keep doing that, there were not a lot of minorities that went in those career paths or had declared those as majors for their undergraduate studies, which means that the pool of candidates then around those underrepresented populations were, were declining. They were not very large. But what we started to do was, instead of us looking very strictly at those who went through those very traditional programs, what are some other skill sets and majors that also lend to opportunities for those individuals to be successful in this environment? And then we started looking at that instead of going strictly by the resume. And that's when we saw we were making a tremendous difference. And so when I talk about intentionality, this is what this looks like. It's not just going off of what you always do and then executing to that, but it's seeing, peeling back the onions. What's the root cause issue here? How can we now identify ways to get different results? Which is going to require a little bit of change management because now it means we're doing something different from what we've done in the past. So I appreciate that comment. Thank you for sharing. 
So Nicole just mentioned implicit bias, and so that's what we're going to talk about now, because I find that it is incredibly important to the work of diversity and inclusion. I want to start by really sharing with each of you that um, we all have biases, basically, and that's nothing um, to be shameful about. It, it just is. Um, we have what's called an internal record. And I know I'm dating myself a little bit here, but you know how they used to say, put the needle on the record, where you play back whatever was on the album to get the music? Well, we have albums or records inside of us, and all of that information that's stored within our capacities, they enter into our, our, our spirit, our souls, by um, things that we've seen, things that we've heard. It could be the media. It could be maybe how we grew up. It depends. There's a variety of different things, but they're there. But what we don't realize is that they're there until they surface. And so part of this work of being an intentional inclusionist and helping to interrupt biases is just being aware when it happens, because it's going to happen, and it's going to happen probably more than what we realize. But we have to be vigilant to make sure that we are recognizing when it does occur. And so I'm going to give you a little example. And I'm not a singer here, but I want you to follow me on this one, OK? And I want to see if you can finish it. The best part of waking up. Is Folgers in your cup? How many of you have Folgers this morning? And did anybody have Folgers? You may have had coffee, but did you have Folgers? Now, when was the last time you heard that? That jingle. I don't even know if they still do it, to be honest with you, right? I don't know. But the bottom line is that you heard it at some point in time, right? And just because I was able to trigger something in you, you were able to re re record that. You were able to bring it back up. And that's what happens. We go through life and we'll hear certain stereotypical things or assumptions made about certain groups and people. And while we may not necessarily endorse those thoughts or even believe those thoughts, they are in here. And whether we realize it or not, they do impact our decision-making ability. They absolutely do. And so that's why we have to be very vigilant to make sure that we recognize when a biases is kind of entering into our decision-making capacity. So what is a bias? I'm not even talking about implicit bias right now. I want to talk about a bias in general. It is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way that's considered to be unfair. Now here are some of the optimal words here. Um, we have in favor of or against. And I think it's important for us to recognize that we can have positive biases and we can have negative biases. And both positive and negative biases can be unfair. I'm going to say that again. Both positive and negative biases can be unfair. So for example, if I'm biased to people who look like me, to where I want to give those individuals the best chance, the best opportunity, I gravitate to them for whatever kind of opportunities that I may have influence over, then that's a bias. That's a bias that could be unfair because there are probably other people outside of those who look like me and that are in my circle that are equally deserving of the opportunity for consideration. But we don't think about that. And then obviously we know how what the negative implications are to a bias that's against someone. But they are learned implicitly and they're within cultural context. So what is implicit bias? We've just defined what bias is in general. So implicit bias is the same thing as bias, but it's unconscious. It's where it's happening and we don't even know it's happening. And that is the most dangerous situation to be in. Because if we're not aware, then we can't change that. We can't even change the way in which we're interacting or behaving. So it's attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So how does it show up in the workplace? Again, I like defining, I like language, so I wanted to find some words quickly. So affinity bias is tendency to warm up to people like ourselves. Again, we gravitate to those who are like us. Halo effect is a tendency to think everything about a person is good because you like that person. So, and I hope no one in here's name is Sally. I'm using this as an example only. But Sally is such a likable person. Now, she's late for work all the time. She doesn't really do what she's supposed to do on her job, and, we, and she's kind of a slacker, but we just like her. We just really, really like her. So because we really, really like her, we are overly forgiving to all of her mistakes and her lack of contributing at an effective level. Please tell me no one in here's name is Sally. <laughs> OK, great. But nonetheless, that is the halo effect. And that is a bias. Perception bias, tendency to form stereotypes and assumptions about certain groups that make it impossible to make an objective judgment about members of those groups. And so automatically, we're lumping people together. And it's hard for us to see an individual because of those assumptions and stereotypes that we have inside, again, of our records about this group. And so everybody kind of is subject to that same type of criticism or, or assumption. That's perception bias. Confirmation bias, tendency for people to seek information that confirms pre-existing beliefs or assumptions. And so if I am trying to make a business case about something that I want to see happen in the organization, I'm going to try to get some buy-in. Well, who am I going to go to if I want buy-in? I'm going to go to the people that I know are going to buy-in, right? 
The people that I know think like me. The people that I know I can convince. That's a bias in and of itself. Instead of going to all of these people that have different varying opinions and perceptions to where you all together can have some healthy banter to land at a place to where it makes sense for all. No, but instead, confirmation is bias. I want to go to people that I know are going to think like me to affirm really where I want us to land. And the group think is similar in the case that where people try too hard to fit into a particular group by conforming, causing them to lose their identity in an organization and causing the organization to miss out on, again, that individualized thinking because now they're conforming, they're thinking like the group. Characteristics of stereotypes and a bias, um, they do not necessarily align with our declared beliefs um, or even reflect stances we would explicitly endorse. And that's just what it is. Just because we have that does not mean that we necessarily believe that. It's just it's there. It's there. And it impacts, again, our decision making. It influences professional judgment and actions that may have negative ramifications. And it implies that all people of that group are all the same. So it takes away our individual ability. Some additional examples of implicit bias, personal insults, inappropriate jokes or comments. Let me say something about this second bullet. I find that just out of the fact that we can become very <coughs> uncomfortable, even if we are witness to someone saying something that we know is a slur or a joke, just something that's inappropriate, the tendency is, is I'm either going to do two things. One is I'm going to laugh because I'm just going to, oh, that's lighthearted. Or I'm uncomfortable, so I don't know what else to do. So I'm just going to kind of chuckle and just hope it goes away. Whether we realize it or not, and sometimes that laugh is unconscious, it perpetuates the problem. It gives that individual the ability to feel like, okay, I'm entertaining you, and people like to entertain people, so they're going to keep doing it at some point in time. And so that's an issue. Or we can just be silent and do nothing at all. And that also can be dangerous, because silence can also send a message, whether we realize it or not. And so this is where it goes back to what I said earlier. If we see something, we have to say something. We have to learn to, again, as intentional inclusion, it's not allow anything that's toxic to enter into an environment that could cause inclusion to be compromised. And so we have to say something. And it may not be the opportune time to say something right then and there, because we don't want to embarrass our colleagues, but there is a time where you can pull someone aside and say, do you remember when we had that conversation and you said X, Y, Z? I just wanted to give you some, are you open to some feedback? Because again, we're assuming positive intent. So inappropriate jokes and comments are forms of implicit bias. Rude interruptions. Let me tell you where this most shows up. In male-dominated environments, to where you have maybe one or two women in the room, and whenever they contribute something, and I'm not picking on the men here, but this is where it often shows up, just for example's sake, and someone speaks over them. One of the men in the room speak over them. They won't let them finish their thought. Or if they say something to contribute to the conversation, it's glossed over or dismissed, and then maybe five minutes later, another male counterpart may make the same point, and everybody says, oh, gosh, that's such a great idea. <laughs> How many women in the room have experienced that? Or you know it to be a true case scenario that happens on the cages. And again, I'm not picking on the men. I'm just letting you see how sometimes these unconscious behaviors can show up that are biases that we don't even realize. That is the reason why in the Obama administration they have what's called, the women had developed what's called amplification. How many of you heard about this or, or read about it? There was a story that was written about it. And what they did was they kind of got fed up of being the, the few women in the room of this male-dominated you know, administration, and they wanted to make sure their voice was being heard. And so what they said was, we're going to band together. And whenever we're in those meetings, every time a female says something, then another female automatically jumps in quickly, you amplify. You repeat what she says, or you give credence to what she says. You say, so, so, as so-and-so just mentioned, or well, like so-and-so just said, well, I agree with so-and-so, but you're amplifying that female message. And it was called amplification and actually caught on to all of these women groups and other organizations and they started doing it as well. But it's important. It's important that we identify when that's occurring. And I'll tell you what can be most impactful is when the men in the room are the ones who are noticing it and trying to change that. So when a man steps up and says, well, like Sally just said, I agree with Sally. That's important. That really is. That's being an ally and an advocate. Treating people as invisible. So again, we can't, we can't omit the people that are kind of quiet and unassuming. Sometimes I feel as though we just deem, well, they, they want to not be noticed. And maybe sometimes that is, that's the case. But at the same time, they also have great skill sets they can contribute. And sometimes they just need a little help. They need people to kind of help them along a little bit. Gender, generational, and cultural stereotyping, we know about that. Insensitivity towards disabilities and other mental, physical conditions. Disrespect, obviously, that's a bias. And lack of empathy. You know, one of the ways in which this shows up 
oftentimes in the workplace is, and I've heard this actually just recently, um, a female is pregnant and she just you know, has to go home early because she's really, really just tired that day. It's gotten the best of her, she needs to leave. And maybe um, a supervisor says or makes some type of remark that leads her to feel like, well, shame on you, you knew what being pregnant was gonna do to you, <laughs> you know? It's, it's lack of empathy and that's a bias. So again, I'm using examples here, but I really wanna to try to drive, drive home the point of how in which this potentially could show up in the marketplace. So how do we interrupt this bias in stereo, and these stereotypes? We'd be vigilant in identifying our own stereotypes. We have to know where we have certain stereotypes that we sometimes subscribe to or allow ourselves to make decisions around and then check those. And you check them by questioning, why do I hold these views? Really taking time to be reflective to think about where is this coming from? Seek out divergent or contradictory information. The reason that I love to be able to go in front of a group of um, students, particularly in, in low income or Title I schools, is because a lot of those students have never even seen an African American female that you know, has aspired to a certain level of success to where maybe they're owning a business or they're working in corporate America, whatever the case may be. And so in that regard, I want to give them something that's contradictory from what they've seen or what they've heard growing up within their community. And that's why you have a lot of those programs. And so part of interrupting bias is seek out information that is very positive about certain groups that maybe you feel like you have some bias against, whether it's unconscious or not. Do your best to overcome defensiveness and reflect. We've used that word several times today. We have to reflect. Focus on each individual. Don't group people together. Challenge others to think and communicate differently. Consistently ask who's missing from the table and who should be at the table. That's a simple one. And it doesn't even have to always be someone that's related you know, or assigned to that project. Maybe just because they have a fresh lens and perspective, bring them in. You never know what that can do. And then be an ally. Microaggressions. Everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group or membership. I want to give you some examples of what this looks like. Before I do that, though, there are three individuals that are a part of the microaggression situation. You have the victim, you have the perpetrator, and then you have the witness. And oftentimes, we can find ourselves in any one of those positions. And so as I go through some examples, I want you just to think to yourselves, okay, so if I was a witness to that situation, what would I do? How would I respond? So here they are, the first one. And these people are holding up signs, and I'll read them because you may can't see them from where you're seated. This young lady is holding a sign, and it says, you don't speak English? Someone's asking her this question. This is a microaggression that she encounters on a frequent basis. You don't speak Spanish? They want to know. And it's because of how she looks. They're just automatically making the assumption, you don't speak Spanish, really? So like, what are you? So when we encounter people that look ethnically ambiguous, asking questions like, so what are you? A human? A person? When people think it's weird that I listen to Carrie Underwood, so this is African-American female, and this is a microaggression that she deals with oftentimes. And we're laughing, and it's fine, and some of these, you know, these are actually real-life situations, but the reality is that this happens every single day, okay? No, you're white. So she looks like she's white, so even when someone asks her, so what are you, and she tells them, they don't believe it, they say, no, you're white, just strictly because of how she looks. That's a microaggression. Okay, this one says, the limited representation of my race in your classroom does not make me the voice of all black people. <laughs> so I have been there. Well, I've been the only black in the room, and I was expected to be the voice of all black people. I was expected to be able to tell how all black people think, act, and behave. <laughs> and I don't know that. <laughs> but we do that. We do that. Okay, so this one says, when I gave a speech about racism, the NC introduced me as James Garcia. My name is Jamie Rodriguez, <laughs> not all Latinos have the last name Garcia. <laughs> Just gave him a last name. Why do you sound white? Growing up, I got this one all the time. You don't sound like you're black. 
How am I supposed to sound? That's a microaggression. This girl sitting next to me moves to sit closer to someone she's talking to, and this white guy whispers loudly that she moved because I smell like rice. How many times have we moved away from someone because of maybe we associate certain foods with a different culture and we say, I don't like that smell? Those are microaggressions. Did they think it wasn't going to get back to her? She heard it. Courtney, I never see you as a black girl. My daughter's name is Hannah. Her middle name is Joy, 70-year-old senior in high school. And she says, Mom, people always are asking me, why do you have a white girl's name? It's a microaggression. Just because I'm Mexican, that doesn't mean that I should be the automatic first choice for the role of Dora the Explorer in the high school skit. How many of the kids know who Dora the Explorer is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, microaggression. So what are you? And she says, human. Being biracial does not make me a what? Can you read this? He showed me a Japanese character on his phone. You're really pretty for a dark-skinned girl. I kid you not, I remember growing up, and I was in middle school, sixth grader, and the daycare came to the middle school to actually pick me up, to take me to, to, to the daycare. And the lady that was the owner of the daycare, she loved my family, and she was very well-intended, I know this, but as a sixth grader, she said to me, your mother is one of the most beautiful black women I've ever met. And as a sixth grader, I knew at that time that that was not right. And, I, and she so wanted me to feel as though this was this huge compliment. And as a sixth grader, I could not. That's a microaggression. These are real life situations. So what do you guys speak in Japan? Asian? A couple more. When standing next to my mom, why is your daughter so white? So her mom apparently has an appearance that clearly identifies her as an ethnic individual and someone's asking her daughter, why, why, why is she so white? So my husband and I are um, we're about the same complexion, and my son is about the same complexion of us, and my daughter is darker, darker skin tone. And she says that she gets people to say all the time, are you adopted? Are those really your mom? Are those really your parents? These are microaggressions that happen every single day. You don't act like a normal black person, you know? Well, what does a normal black person act like? So, what does your hair look like today? She said as she pulled off my hat without my permission. So, touching black women's natural hair. Um, these happen every single day. Here's another one that I wish if I had a nickel for every time I, I heard this, I would be a millionaire. But you speak so, you're so articulate. What did you expect? Again, these are microaggressions that happen every single day. It's not to make anyone feel uncomfortable. It's not to shame or guilt anyone. I don't believe in that. But it's simply to say that these are, microaggressions are unbiased oftentimes. We don't even know that we're doing these things. So that we can stop doing them, because our intent is not to offend people, we have to learn what these things are and how they show up. So that is my intent in showing them to you. So I want to do a couple of micro-learning activities. One of the handouts that um, Johnny has, we're going to put you in groups right now. We're going to do this rather quickly, and it's going to be a timed assignment. Actually, if you don't mind helping me, um, maybe just get like two or three people to a group, and let's try to give out as many as possible. But here's what's going to happen. This exercise is called First Impressions. And I want, I'm giving you instructions, so I want to keep your attention, please. But this exercise is called First Impressions. You're going to group in teams of about two to three people, and you're going to be given a sheet of paper. If Once you get it, turn it over. And I want you looking at the, the topic right now. So turn it over once you get it. And at the top, there is a category of people. And what I'm going to ask you to do, this will be a timed exercise, you are to come up with as many thoughts, first impressions as possible. I want you to try to fill that page up as much as you can, and this is going to be timed. But here's the trick. I want you to really allow yourself to be vulnerable. I want you to do this in a fashion to where you're uncensored. You don't hesitate. What comes up, I want it to come out and be on that paper. Okay? So without hesitation, avoid judging and avoid explaining your answers. 
Whatever comes up needs to go into the paper. Okay, let's prepare to come back, please. Let's prepare to come back. Okay, here's what we're going to do. If I could have your attention, please. Here's what we're going to do. And we're going to do this quickly. Um, we're going to start at this table. We're going to go around. And what I want you to do is read the category at the top of your page. And I want you to just list off everything that you have written down in terms of your first thoughts about that group. And I want us all to please listen as each group will read out their information. And again, even as you read them off, I don't want you explaining. I don't want you censoring. Just read them straight off. Let's start here. Mine was physically challenged. Physically challenged. Um, I put can't read or write, handicap, broken language, a womanizer, great perspective, and a woman. Okay. Did you have the same one, or did you guys watch a different one? Okay. Type A personalities. Type A personalities. Controlling perfectionist, unappreciative, high achiever, high strong, action oriented, demanding, bossy, results oriented, smart, chauvinistic. Let's go here. Millennials, job hoppers, entitled, indifferent, non-committal, no phone calls, want to text, um, ideal uh, dreamers, like they want ideal situations, um, but they do want to make a difference, no winners and losers, life is more important than just work, um, they are inclusive, they don't see diversity like we do, and they are not money motivated. This is all, do you have another one? What did you have? The oh, category. Sorry, uh, Southerners. Southerners. Y'all listen up, please. Hospitable. Are you smart because you talk slow? Uh, surface? Oh, very surface. Yeah, surface. Uh, strong accent, polite, good cooks, can't drive, and proper. Thank you, Southerners. Okay, let's go here. I think we might have done this one wrong, but our category was African American. So African American women. Like who, who we thought of? So Michelle Obama, Oprah, Claire Huxtable. We made like a list of okay. people who came okay. to our minds. So okay. We posted a little bit different. Okay. Okay. So your first thoughts were to think of people that are actually part of that category: African American women. Okay. Gotcha. Here. Uh, white males. White males. Uh, breadwinner, uh, in charge individual, educated, privileged. Okay. Thank you. Let's go here. What's your category? People who live in the city. People who live in the city. Have money, educated, don't drive well, snob, like craft beer. <laughs> <laughs> no kids, career focused, party, and liberal. Thank you. Next group. All right, we got the LGBTQ community. LGBTQ community. Liberal. Was there another one on this table? Or was it all of them? Perfect. Thank you. Let's go here. Um, we have Muslims. Muslims. Uh, we wrote women blamed for 9 11, uh, discriminated against, Middle East, and then hijab or turban. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I had Christians. Christians. Church, majority, judgy, Bible study, Southern, traditional, and closed minded. Thank you. Women, women, empathy, emotions, children, makeup, clothes, mom slash wife, and feminine. Okay. Um, I had wealthy people, I had extravagant, frivolous, lazy kids, unsympathetic, screwed, stuck up, always traveling and shopping, and skinny. <laughs> <laughs> poor people. Yeah, poor people. Uh, so thank you, Chen, you know you way, welfare, um, and disadvantage, and homeless. Homeless. Thank you. Let's go to this table over here. We Who's have a real stream of consciousness. We have a lot of words, and I'm feeling the need to explain them now. No, don't explain them. <laughs> <laughs> we have Asian Americans. Okay, Asian Americans. We have discipline, ping pong, hard work, good at math, family business, good food, strict parents, um, polite, and proud. Okay. Then so we have men. Men. Very long. Okay. Very long list, she says. Smart. Uh, egotistical, loud, tall, black, humility, father figure, family man, man only, skinny man, sports cars, hot and lastly, 
Okay. Okay. Next group. Next group. Is there another one at that table? Okay. okay. We had African American males. African American males. Personable, good sense of humor, stylish, athletic, cultured, disenfranchised, or underprivileged, and closed in. Great. Is that the only one from this yeah. table? Okay, fantastic. Okay, first and foremost, before we debrief on that, give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. And I said that because sometimes this is not an easy exercise. How many of you, by show of hands, you found this to be an easy exercise? No one found it easy. How many of you found it incredibly difficult and you wish you had not have had engaged in this exercise? <laughs> okay, I see some hands. How many of you are somewhat indifferent about it? Maybe you feel like you're a little bit better off for having to engage in, in at least this, this vulnerable moment of learning. Anyone in that category, maybe? A few of you are? Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that because that was really the intent, you know. Um, the purpose of this exercise was really to say, again, that we all have biases. Now, I want to talk about some of the commonalities. What did we hear that was some recurring themes around each of these categories? Did you? Go ahead. Only the negative. Only the negative? So that's what you noticed? Yeah. That's what stood out to you is only the negative, yeah. But was there only negative things said? No. There were positive and negative things expressed about each of these different groups. Are all of those things true that we talked about? No. So do we think that the negative things that we came up with and we put on the paper is because we really truly believe and we view that group in that light? Moment of vulnerability here. Not necessarily, right? It's because it's that internal record. So where did that stuff come from then? If you don't believe that about these groups, the negative things that you said, where did it come from? TV? Experiences, yeah. So if you were able to think of those, have those first thoughts to be reflective of those groups and placed on paper, how many of you can see how easy and unconscious it could be for when you're in the workplace every single day making decisions that some of those thoughts could enter into the equation, even without you knowing or thinking about it? You see how easy that can be? That's why we do this exercise, is to, to make sure that, you know, again, we are recognizing that the propensity is there. It's going to happen. But where the opportunity exists is when we are vigilant enough to be mindful to when it does happen, that we can change that and make sure that it's not negatively creating implications that could cause someone else to not be able to be successful. And so that was really the point of the exercise. One of the things that I want you to do is leave them on your table because I'm going to take them with me. <laughs> I don't want this to end up in your book bag or on your desk and someone say, what is this all about? So I want to make sure that I do, that I do take them up before I leave, so don't take them with you. And we're going, to, we're going to wrap up this way. So with that exercise, as we have acknowledged, there were some things that were said that, again, were just part of our internal records, not that we endorse those things or we really value those thoughts at all, but there were some things that were said that were negative, so I never want to leave us there. I want to give you an opportunity to share if there's something that you never again want people to say, think, or do about maybe an identity group that you belong to, I want to give you that permission right now to share that, or maybe perhaps you want to share something that you value about your group if you are a part of one of those identity groups that were shared today that you want others in the room to know. This is your chance. Anybody? Are we all comfortable? If we are, I want to open it up for questions at this time. I've shared a lot, so I want to give you a chance to ask me questions about something perhaps that may be still perhaps a little unsettling or unclear for you. I want to make sure that we take the chance to address your questions and your comments. What thoughts and questions do you have? Mm -hmm. Well, for some people it is. But, but um, that's the thing. There's so much about, for some people, this could be, some people that could be, uh, that, you know, and might not be. So it's really hard to, I don't know. I, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. The intent of today, and, and of a lot of these training sessions, is not at all to cause people to feel like they have to walk on eggshells. Right. 
That's not the intent. But, and here's the thing, different things are gonna land on people different ways. But because there are a population of people that looked as though they, that their assumption is, somebody draws the conclusion of the assumption that you shouldn't be able to speak so eloquently, you know, English, because that is offensive to a number of, a pe of people, being aware of that then causes people to have a level of sensitivity around it. Yeah, and if somebody were... Too, um, I, I, I fear on the other side, too. Like, I, I get tired of people being so sensitive about everything a little bit. But, but yes, I'm aware, and, you know, you have to be, but there's a, there's a line. You there is a line. Know? Yeah, there's so a line. Are you saying, like, the thing about what are you? Okay, so that's not necessarily a great way to say it, but is it offensive to say what's your nationality? No. And I think that's the difference, it's the wording. Language is so important. For me to ask, well, what, what is your nationality? Versus, what are you? Mm -hmm. it, it lands on people very different. And, and again, I think that the notion for today is there's not like a, a clear-cut line of right and wrong. It's just a, a sense of awareness that we have to have about the sensitivities that exist that could cause someone to not feel as though they are in a space that's inclusive, that's inviting, and that's never our intent. And so here's what I always err on. If I know that, then I am going to make sure that I'm not doing something. Now again, I can't control what I don't know. And again, that's why I talked a lot about we have to extend grace and accept grace, because there is a lot that we don't know. But when we are exposed to this type of information, then I think that it behooves us as leaders to exercise a level of sensitivity and leadership around not intentionally trying to make someone feel alienated. And that's the thing. And if someone brings it to our attention because they're willing to have that courageous conversation to say, I know you didn't mean this, so I'm extending grace, that's another way to say I know you didn't mean this, but let me tell you how it made me feel. Once I know that, then that becomes my responsibility to not try to intentionally make that person feel that way. It's almost as though, I get the question a lot, some people are offended by being referred to as African American instead of black. And I get that question a lot. So when is it right to say black? When is it right to say African American? Well, universally speaking, if I'm communicating to a group, then universally, the more appropriate way to refer to African Americans, black individuals, would be African Americans. But if I'm talking to someone one-on-one -on -one and they let me know I don't like being referred to as African American, then I'm not going to intentionally use that language when I'm talking to them or about them. And so I think it's just a matter of common courtesy. And when we do find ourselves in a situation to where we are exposed to something that could be offensive, whether or not we personally would take offense to it, that still leads us to a place where we have an opportunity an opportunity to try not to alienate and to try not to offend. And just to piggyback on that, on that Jane, I think Nika made a good point. It's about the relationship. So if you have a relationship with someone, mm -hmm. it may, you may be more comfortable asking questions that you wouldn't ask if you're just meeting someone initially. So I think it's all about how do you form that relationship. And I was at a PhD project event in El Paso last week, and it was on Hispanic educational excellence. And I didn't realize that for Hispanics, some do not like to be called Hispanic Americans. They like to be called either Latinx or Latinos or Latinas. But again, it's all about us exposing ourselves and becoming aware of other cultures and being more confident about that because I just never knew that there was a difference, but there is because of oppression. There's a history of what they, they perceive as Spanish oppression. It's the same way for an African American who may be asked, hey, you talk this way. Well, there's a history there that makes it a little bit different when you ask them. It's context, things. yeah. It's context that sometimes people don't have the luxury of, of having that context that causes someone to have a level of offense to it. And maybe your experience is not such to where it, it creates that level of offense for you, clearly, as you shared. But for some, they do because there's greater context behind it that we just don't know about. And, and here's what I want to say, too, because I completely understand your point. We don't want to live in this world where we can't be our authentic selves by being able to be real because we're now having to walk on eggshells everywhere that we go. And so, and I think, that, I think there is a balance to it. The intent today was, though, to expose you to information that we could be unconscious of that has been reported time and time again in this space as creating negative implications for people, causing them to not, again, to feel alienated and not be able to bring their, their whole selves to an environment where they feel accepted and a sense of belongingness. And again, if our intent here is to try to create that sense of belongingness, because again, we rely on people to not question whether or not they belong, but to really feel that sense of belongingness, then why not have that as part of our leadership ability to want to make sure that we're not offending people where we can and where we are aware of it. So that's really the intent. Any other questions or thoughts? Has this been helpful for you? Have you learned something today? 
I have to admit, you all are a, more of a, you're a little bit of a quiet group than I'm used to. But um, I think I got you a little bit warmed up towards the end, and I appreciate your participation. So one of the things that you have in front of you, hopefully you've been taking notes on the front, um, but it's an intentional inclusionist card. On the back, I do want you to put your name and the date, and there's a commitment statement here at the top, and I'm going to read the commitment statement to you. And what I ask that you do is that before you leave here today, while this information is fresh and top of mind, I want you just to jot down two or three things that are key takeaways for you that you are committing yourself to as you continue on this journey to grow as an inclusion-minded leader. And here's what it says. As an intentional inclusionist, I commit to growing as an inclusion-minded leader and leveraging my influence to enhance the workplace, build communities, and have positive impact on any circle I belong. I will exercise intention to deliver upon this commitment in the following ways. And then I hope that this will serve as a reminder to you of some of the conversations we've had today and of the importance of growing as an inclusion-minded leader and leveraging your influence, again, to create the inclusion that our organizations deserve and that our communities deserve. <coughs> I have really enjoyed being with you, and I thank you kindly for the invite, and I hope that you continue to flourish as you, again, just demonstrate leadership in this space of um, inclusion and diversity. So thank you all so very much. <laughs>